the work I'm showing you today and the studies is a bit of a, a summary, a, a worldwide tour of uh, different things I've been working on over the last couple of years and putting them together, which I think is into like a, as little puzzle pieces into a, a very coherent picture of what we can do when we connect exoplanet science with stellar physics and get inspiration from astrobiology colleagues, uh, from chemists, um, from atmospheric physics uh, in, uh, experts and, and other folks. Uh, but before I start this little worldwide tour of habitable worlds and stellar flares, um, I wanted to use this opportunity also in my new capacity uh, as, a, uh, as an ESA representative for KOPS um, to give a short save the date uh, warning. So anybody who's interested in any type of observational astronomy, um, be it mostly for exoplanet science, but also for more exotic topics like exomoons, ring structures, trans-Neptunian objects, etc., might have a big interest in the KOPS mission. And um, we are foreseeing the fourth call for announcements of opportunities. Um, as just about two weeks ago on the 7th of March, um, ESA's science program committee has granted the extended mission for KOPS for the coming years. Uh, we are able to run these programs again to open time for the community. We'll have about 30% of the total science time available to the community and only 50 reserve targets on KOPS, all the rest um, available for you and your colleagues. Um, so if you're interested in this, please. Uh, read up on the website that I've linked here, uh, get in touch with me, um, but also forward this uh, to your colleagues if you like, uh, if you know anybody who might be interested. Now, back to the topic of habitable worlds and stellar flares, and just to set the scene, and I think most of you are familiar by now with the topic of exoplanets and how it relates to our solar system, but I still like to show this image um, that I created here, comparing our solar system, our sun, and uh, mere eight planets, with the diversity and this huge pool of extrasolar planets or exoplanets. And actually just this morning, I looked up the number again, 5,312 confirmed exoplanets to date and uh, thousands and thousands of new candidates. Uh, so while this picture highlights, I think in the, the sheer number of exoplanets that we have, I think the most interesting part for me personally is actually the diversity of worlds that we discovered. Uh, in particular, looking at the curious demography of super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. And I always like to think about it and, and in lectures with students, etc., raise the question um, in the context of what actually makes a planet or an exoplanet a world, and how do we define these things? Uh, so if we look at terrestrial planets and we look at our solar system, well, there's our Earth, right? Uh, but by size, which is pretty much uh, what we can see for exoplanets, especially with the nowadays, uh, these uh, photometric missions like uh, spearheaded by Kepler, TESS, and uh, follow-up missions like KOPS, etc. All we get is this picture that I show here. But if we were an alien civilization looking back at our solar system and we wanted to detect something from there, it's actually really hard because even in our solar system, there's this huge diversity of the same size or even same bulk density planets not being the same type of planets and some maybe like not really qualifying as worlds depending on who you might ask um, we can go from mercury with a mere wisp of an atmosphere 10 to the minus 14 bar and mostly hydrogen dominated all the way to venus with a 100 bar atmosphere which is mostly co2 dominated and uh, neither of these could sustain our uh, way of life uh, how it evolved on earth but if we let loose of like just talking about Earths in the context of habitability and exoplanet discoveries and we go towards the sub-Neptune regime, I think this is especially where the exoplanet field has opened new avenues because discovering a small temperate planet is not enough. Um, we could have uh, the same size, the same bulk density, but hiding behind it could be either of these three or a mixture of these three scenarios could be an outgust envelope where we have a thick iron core rocky mantle hydrogen atmosphere around it it could be a nebula captured envelope where we have slightly smaller core surrounded by a water layer and then a hydrogen helium rich atmosphere or we could have these water dominated worlds where actually the core is much smaller again we have a really thick water layer making up the same bulk entities and to really quantify what these are is currently impossible. Um, we're just starting to get a handle on that with the newest missions, uh, such as KOPS or JWST, and in the future, Ariel or Lubex class missions. If we put this into context, I always like to say that these type of 
mini Neptunes or sub Neptunes are somewhat the missing link because we don't have them in our solar system, but we find that they're extraordinarily ubiquitous around other stars, uh, especially around M dwarf stars. Many, many, many of them host these sub Neptunes. And the question is why do 75% of all the stars in the galaxy, uh, M dwarf stars, host predominantly sub Neptunes and super Earths? And why does our sun not do that? And our sun being the only system where we have life uh, that we know. How does this relate? What does this tell us about the global uh, chances for life? Um, so if we put this together into this context of exoplanet observations, again, there's this famous diagram that shows the planet size in Earth radii on the y-axis here and the incident volumetric flux in Earth units, so how much stellar input we receive. And we see there's two very distinct populations separated by this radius valley but also separated slightly in slope by this incident volumetric flux valley. And there's been a, a whole range of studies on this and uh, I'm sure many EII talks already in the past about this. But what does it tell us now observationally? Well, we found this, but we can't from this diagram probe actually the existing systems because most of these came from Kepler and they were too faint to follow them up with other missions, too faint to probe the atmospheres, for example, with JWST. So, if we want to probe these different formation and evolution hypotheses, whether it being photo evaporation, for example, where we lose the atmosphere because of the XUV output um, from the whole star that deposits a lot of energy into the exoplanet's atmosphere, heating it up until we reach a Parker type thermal escape, or um, to probe whether it could be core powered mass loss, where we have internal heat remaining in the planet's core from the formation, which then heats up the atmospheric layers from the inside again, leading to a, a parker type thermal escape, or whether we have gas pore formation, um, where we just believe that planets may have just formed like this because there was not enough in the protoplanetary nebula on material to be accumulated. But if we want to probe these things, then we need ways to scrutinize them. And looking at the de demography like this is great to give us the first puzzle piece, but we need an actual system where we can practice and observe. And for that, I want to highlight one of the many systems. And obviously, I'm personally biased because there's a system uh, I discovered and I follow up. But by now, we have uh, maybe a dozen or, or more of very promising systems in that regard, where for the first time ever, as of just a few years ago, we actually can observationally probe systems that have super Earths and sub Neptunes in the same system. Because very often, we find, for example, an M dwarf uh, host star only with sub Neptunes or an M2 Foster only with super Earths. But having a system where we have, like here in TY 270, one super Earth and two sub Neptunes is still pretty rare. And uh, this original discovery here came from 2019 and was based on some of the first months of our transiting exoplanet survey satellite or TESS mission uh, year one. And we, for this, we use the, the transit method that I just showcase here, but I know uh, all of you are very familiar with it already. Uh, we measure the brightness as a function over time and the transit of the planet in front of this stellar disk. And the first data that we gathered on the system is shown here in terms of a light curve relative flux over transit midtime folded up uh, to the according periods. And TOI 270b, shown in blue here, is this tiny super Earth uh, in the bottom left of the of the left plot, with a period of just over three days, uh, with planet C and planet D being these super uh, sorry these sub Neptunes with periods of five point six and eleven point four days. Now, why is this system special? Uh, well, for one, it bridges this radius valley, but that doesn't help us much yet. We also need it to be observable with follow up missions. And for that, I um, just want to highlight here how the system at the date of discovery in 2019 was lying in comparison to all the other targets we had at that moment with measured radii and measured masses uh, shown in gray. And you see this little star in the left diagram as a brightness versus distance. So this is one of the brightest and closest systems to Earth uh, that we had at that moment and that we still have. And on the right plot, you can see the planet radius as a function of distance with the three planets as the yellow, red, and blue dots. And you can see these are also three of the smallest planets that are closest to Earth. And that means it's incredibly favorable for both radial velocity studies, because the system is bright, is close by. We can monitor it with HARPS and Espresso and other machines, but also for transit time invariations. Because if you remember the periods I briefly talked about a few slides ago, 
uh, about 3.3, uh, 5.6 uh, and 11.4 days, these are actually in mean motion resonances. Um, that means that periodically the two or three planets come so close to each other in the orbit that they start perturbing each other gravitationally. And that leads to a very nice, uh, more or less sinusoidal pattern over time, which also allows us to measure the masses. So we have two independent ways actually in the system to measure masses. And while our collaborators focused on the radial velocity method, we have focused on the transit timing variations ever since uh, 2019. And for the past four years, we've been following the system up, for example, with TESS, uh, but also with ESO ground-based uh, observatories such as NGTS in the top right here, Speculus in the bottom left, and uh, its predecessor TRAPPIST, um, but also ASTEP, the Antarctic uh, search for exoplanets on the bottom right shown here. And a lot of other international instruments that helped us out. I think in total, we had maybe almost a dozen, uh, including amateur astronomers that helped us. And we continued gathering more and more of these transits over the last four years. And here's just a, a short selection of some of them. And uh, if you look at this midline that you can see in these plots, you even see how the transit dances a little bit to the left and right of this. But a much better view on this is this uh, famous uh, O minus C diagram or the TTV signal diagram, where we can see on the x-axis the signal in days, uh, how early or how late did the transit arrive compared to what we predicted. And on the x-axis, we see the time, so the last four years of monitoring. And you can see that in the first uh, about two years since the discovery, we've been staying on the system nonstop. And then we had a little bit of a break um, for a few months and started uh, really going after it again um, last year. And right now we keep on monitoring it and we're anticipating to have another uh, publication on this soon. But to take the point away already, what can we get from monitoring the TTVs? Well, we can get refined masses, as said, uh, because of uh, modeling this whole gravitational pull, the stance of the planets and the mean motion resonance with n-body simulations can give us very strong constraints on the orbits and the masses of these systems. And we can compare this with the radial velocity findings. And here you can see in this plot full of, uh, full of lines and scatters, um, if you uh, look at the cyan and the yellow um, data points in here, you can see planet B, planet C, and planet D. And the yellow part here is actually from the radial velocity um, papers that were published by our colleagues and the cyan part um, from our TTV studies. And we can see how well they agree. Um, so these are one sigma error bars, and there is a little bit of shickle here and there. There's a little bit of systematic uh, difference, but especially planet C and D are overlapping. And planet B, uh, which is the hardest to track down because the signal to noise ratio is very low in all of these measurements, um, still within two sigma has a very good agreement. Now on the y-axis here, you can see the planet radius. On the x-axis, you can see the planet mass. And all these lines that you see are actually the compositions of hypothetical models. Um, for example, whether it is um, Earth-like, it's this green line here, whether it's 100% rocky body, uh, which is the gray line here, or whether we could have something like a mixture where we have a hydrogen uh, and water envelope, etc. And this plot already shows us, well, planet B's bulk composition is probably very similar to Earth, uh, maybe even less of atmosphere and less of water, much more of a, a rocky ball. Um, it's definitely not an iron ball, and it's definitely not a gas ball. While planet C and D, the ones in the upper uh, part on the left diagram of this radius valley, um, they're most likely some type of mixture, maybe ice and rock, maybe a, a very thick envelope, uh, maybe a water planet. Now we took the next step to characterize this, which is to look into the atmosphere and see what we can pick out there. And there was a study that was recently published by my uh, colleague, um, Thomas Michael Evans, um, and a few other colleagues and myself, where we targeted TY 270D uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we find the first evidence of water in a hydrogen-rich atmosphere of a sub-Neptune-sized planet, which indicates that this is most likely this composition that is shown here, where we have a big iron core and, and rocky mantle, but we also have a water outer layer. So it's not just a core with a hydrogen-helium atmosphere, but it is somewhere in between one of these high sea and worlds, um, not quite an ocean world, um, not quite something like a scaled up earth, um, but it's actually a bit of a mixture of the two. 
Um, so we have a, a big water reservoir on this planet, most likely. Um, more to come on this. This uh, observation, this paper here, is based on a single uh, observation of planet D. Um, we now have in our pipeline three observations of planet C and two more of planet D. So there's a lot more to come, uh, but also a lot of care to be taken in analyzing these data sets, ruling out any systematics, et cetera, to really be sure um, that stellar heterogeneity does not um, perturb our results, et cetera. Um, but obviously, if we can now in the future go after the system with a much higher uh, resolution and different wavelengths with JWST, and especially tackle planet B with JWST or future LUVEX class missions, um, then we can really conduct comparative planetology um, of three bodies formed in the same protoplanetary nebula and deduct, have they all formed by the same pathway? Do they show the same signatures? Um, or is there a complete uh, heterogeneity here? Is there a complete divergence? Uh, say we don't find any water signals in planet C. Um, why would these two sub Neptunes on such similar orbits form so differently? Um, so there's a lot of open questions still to be answered, but uh, I think it's, it's a really nice um, summary like or example of where we stand right now in the exoplanet field that we actually can start to tackle and observationally scrutinize all these theoretical hypotheses that we've built up over the last decade or two. And that again can inform our solar system, like why do these types of planets not exist? Maybe it's the radiation from these M dwarfs, maybe it's the way they're formed so close to the star. Um, or, or other evolutionary pathways that play a role in this. One of these aspects, obviously, and that's uh, already in, uh, hidden in my title that I want to come to now, is the input of the host star. Um, this could be driven by stellar winds or by the XUV radiation, which um, massively could evaporate the atmospheres of any type of planet that forms around them. But what I want to focus on mostly are the most energetic outbursts here, and those are stellar flares and coronal mass ejections. Now, I'm sure many of you or maybe all of you are already familiar with this topic, um, but what are stellar flares and what are coronal mass ejections? Well, they are massive, immense brightening events that release radiation across the whole spectrum. Uh, it can go from the X-ray to the UV all the way uh, into the optical spectrum. And uh, in the most extreme cases, uh, we can even realize them and see them uh, on our Earth from our sun by eye sometimes, uh, as it happened about 150 years ago, but more about them later. These stellar flares, um, these brightening events that you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, um, but it's this brightening event in the top right corner. They are often accompanied by coronal mass ejection. This is an actual uh, footage from the sun. Um, where you can see these charged particle streams um, that get ejected from the uh, solar atmosphere, from solar corona. And together, these two events, they can release energies of up to the 10 to the 38 erg, um, which in other terms <laughs> equals millions of nuclear bombs all at once going off. So it's very clear that these stellar outbursts can drastically shape the exoplanets around them especially if those planets are like in TOI 270 or TRAPPIST-1 or our systems on daily or weekly orbits. So this can be a massive danger. Um, <clears throat> they can interfere with the atmospheric chemistry, but they could also go to that extent that they completely strip off the atmospheres, uh, a wide range of, uh, of influence and risk. On the other hand, the flares might actually be what initiates life in the very first place by triggering UV preverted chemistry. So in laboratory experiments, by shining UV lamps onto a little primordial soup of simple molecules, uh, our colleagues or prebiotic chemists can actually trigger the processes leading to perceived or assumed precursors of RNA. And for that, we need this UV light, which stellar flares around M dwarfs can provide. So what really fascinates me here is this uh, interplay and understanding where this fine, sweet spot of enough but not too much flaring lies. Now, how do we tackle this in a quantitative and systematic way? Well, this is where our test uh, flare study comes in that we've conducted over the past couple of years. So here you can see the NASA uh, test satellite and a whole map um, created from test years uh, or cycles one and two of observations 
um, with little inlet of, uh, of a flaring M dwarf here. And then TESSET stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, a mission that was launched in 2018 by our colleagues at NASA. And it first scanned through the entire sovereign sky in 13 stripes over year one, and then through the entire northern sky in 13 stripes over year two. And it took images of the whole field of view every 30 minutes, stacking up this collage that we see here. But it also had postage stamp cutouts, uh, where it took images every two minutes for about 200,000 stars. Now, if we zoom in on this big collage and we go to like one of these postage stamps, this is what we see. It's an 11 by 11 pixel cutout of our CCD image. And that yellow blob that you see in this image here, that is actually just a neighboring star, a very boring star, a sun-like star. Um, not the one that I want to draw your attention to because the one that I'm gonna be speaking about is marked in these little white boxes here, which is our aperture. So it's barely visible right now, but it is there in this region. Let's just look at the same image pixels one hour later and boom, we suddenly have an immense brightening of the star, seemingly out of nowhere. So continuing to take pictures, let's see how this looks like after say a couple more hours and it's all gone again. So the star is back to its quiescent brightness, barely visible to our detectors. And if we draw this now as a light curve, we plot the flux as a function of time, because we take images every few minutes, um, we can see that this particular red dwarf actually got brighter by a factor of about 16. So we can't even imagine anything like that on our sun. If you're standing outside, even I'm based in the Netherlands right now, even if I stand outside in this cloudy day, uh, 16 times brightening event by the sun would have very detrimental consequences on my life. Um, and this is the biggest flare that we saw in the first two months of test data. By now, in the first couple of years, we've actually seen flares that reach a more than 60-fold increase of brightness. But what do we do with this? Um, this is one example, one light curve. How do we approach now this whole sky in a systematic way? Well, this is where like our human capacity ends in terms of time, uh, because going through all of these light curves by eye would literally take me a lifetime. Uh, I've estimated that. It's not just a phrase. So we employed um, first traditional outlier uh, methods to then train uh, on our sample a machine learning algorithm. So in the new era of all sky service, we have millions of stars. And in this case, we analyzed 200,000 of the short cadence test targets. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight here the Stellar software package that was uh, developed by my colleague Adina Feinstein from the University of Chicago here, um, which we trained on our original flare findings and can now apply to all the new incoming test data of the, the newest months and, uh, and, and, and sectors. And uh, actually, coincidentally, Adina is defending her PhD uh, today, so fingers crossed for her. So just like Google and Facebook can differentiate between photos of, of cats and dogs, we can do that with flares. So let's apply this to all of the test data that we have here. What do we get from there? What I show here is the Kepler data um, from the published Kepler flare catalogs of the last couple of years, where we see actually the test magnitude on the y-axis, how bright is the star, the brightest stars being on top. And on the x-axis, we see the effective temperature uh, with something like F stars on the very left, so the very big uh, bright stars, and M dwarfs on the right, um, where we have uh, things like TRAPPIST-1 at the very right edge of this plot. Now, in our first test study, based on only the first two months of data, we could already explore a completely new parameter space in this regard, uh, a large ensemble of flaring red dwarf stars. But if we now add all of the data from tests year one and two onto this, we can dramatically expand this. And this is if we only trust the really high probability flares. So you see how this plot explodes. You see how the histograms on the sides that you might not have even noticed before uh, start exploding. But if we go and trust the um, machine learning algorithm more and say we take all the flares where it's at least 50% sure that it's a flare, we get massive statistics out of this. And that's the nice thing as well with this machine learning algorithm uh, with convolutional neural networks. We can actually put probabilities to this and we can actually do meaningful completeness analysis, etc. Now, if we focus a little bit more on the one dimensional axis um, and we just look at the effective temperature or the spectral type on the x-axis and then see what fraction of stars uh, do we actually find to be flaring here. 
I can plot here in um, in dark blue the confirmed and in light blue the candidate flares. Um, confirmed being at least ninety percent sure, candidate being at least fifty percent sure that's a flare. Um, the all targets uh, is obviously at the the hundred percent uh, level here <laughs> um, because there's a subplot of of many plots. And in red we have a little like completeness um region because test does not go to the very faint end uh, so we end up with like uh, m4 and 5 types normally with tests but we can see that there's actually an interesting distribution here um where fgk stars um we basically find a very even um about 5 to 10 percent distribution or fraction of flaring stars and then we start ramping up very drastically towards the m0 regime and up to like the around M4 type regime. Uh, so if I zoom a little bit more into this M type regime, uh, on the left, we see the test results that we have. And we see how we go up from about 10-15% uh, for M0 types to the M3 level. And then we stay constant until the M6 level. We can now compare this with dedicated surveys to look at the fainter end or the, at the redder end of things at the more infrared end of, uh, of stars, uh, such as our speculus survey. And that's uh, contributed by a colleague of mine, Katrina Murray, who's now a, a postdoc uh, in the US in uh, Boulder. And in her study, we did exactly what we did here with TESS, but we looked at it from the other end and started at the M4 regime going all the way to the brown dwarf regime, so the L0 class uh, and beyond. And there are some error bars in here, um, but pretty much we have a plateau at this like 40-50% level of flaring stars um, in the mid M dwarf regime. And then suddenly we drop down again. So there are some physics at play. There's also a lot of caveats to discuss. And I put that down on the, on the bottom. And I'm happy to discuss those more later. Um, these are like selection biases, sampling biases, um, signal to noise biases, but also flare contrast biases, uh, because flares are usually very hot. So a strong flare on a very infrared active star and then will pop up much more in our blue sensitive detectors things like this uh, so we have to be very careful in interpreting this and in debiasing this but i think it's an interesting interesting result uh, so it seems just that the m dwarfs we look at here are just much more active than the fgk stars and that plays a huge role especially if we look at life how do we connect this now? How do we connect these ensemble studies, these demographic studies to anything uh, telling us about habitability? Well, on the left, you can see again, a light curve this time, a flux over time and days over a 28 day period and color uh, coded by our neural network by Stella. Yellow being the parts where Stella says, oh, this is just boring, uh, rotational modulation, spots, et cetera, normal activity. But then in dark blue, you can see these spikes and these spikes are flares. So Stella picks out all these flares. And now we can introduce the flare frequency diagram, which is a cumulative distribution histogram. The X axis here shows a given threshold energy and the Y axis shows how many flares with that energy can we observe on average per day. So if we look at this one star here that I put as an example, tick 1419, and we look at the light curve, we see we have one big flare there um, at around uh, day uh, 1660. And that big flare we estimate has an energy of 10 to the 35.5 ERC. So we reach this energy once every few weeks, uh, once every 28 days. So we can draw this into this cumulative distribution diagram. We can also count all the smaller flares and we can estimate, for example, at this end of the diagram, we have flares with energies of at least 10 to the 33 ERC once every few days and that's how we build up this survival function or inverse cumulative probability function and now we can compare this with our sun because our sun also flares as we know but on a drastically different scale so overplotting our sun here shows just how many orders of magnitudes more quiet the sun is than an arbitrary m dwarf star that we look at here um, these like flares with 10 to the 33 ERC, for example, um, that appear every couple of days on this M dwarf. They ac appear every 10 to the minus five days, uh, so every couple of centuries on, on our sun. And that actually puts us in the right ballpark because the 
largest solar flare ever recorded, the Carrington event from 1859, only reached an energy of estimated to be about 10 to the 32.5 ERG. Um, so the predictions we have here for the sun are quite in line with this. But this happened about 150 years ago. And if we trust these predictions, um, then a Carrington event like flare is due about every 150 years. Uh, so we had some very big events uh, actually in the last couple of years, actually in 2012, when the Mayas predicted the world to end. And there was a very big one that just uh, the coronal mass ejection coming with this flare just missed our Earth. Um, but we're pretty much due the next Carrington event very soon. Uh, so that's a bit of a scary, a scary aspect. Um, but in the end, we have a very comfortable situation here on Earth because let me plot a couple more of those red dwarf systems or M dwarf systems. And these are just randomly arbitrary picked systems where we find flares with tests. What catches the eye is that all of them are much more active than our sun. Uh, but also that there's an interesting intrinsic spread among them. So their, their slopes are different. They're sometimes a little bit shifted. Some seem to like have like this blue curve that you see here has extremely energetic flares, uh, basically almost uh, every couple of hours. So we don't really understand yet why that is. Uh, there's a lot left to learn from us. So we need to like correlate these values with everything else we can know about these stars, um, maybe uh, their age, uh, other activity indicators, their rotation rates, etc. But importantly, um, we haven't observed them that long uh, either. So this, uh, some of these are maybe observed for a year with tests, uh, maybe two years, because we have these gaps in the observing window function. Um, we have no data like for the sun, where we have close-up images, uh, etc. But uh, we're getting there. We're getting uh, more and more data. We're getting uh, more and more robust statistics and we can build up these kind of power law approximations we can extrapolate into unobserved regimes and now this is what allows us to link the demographic findings from photometric surveys to actual criteria for life in in a very very first baby step approach so i'm not over promising here um, but we can link some things from different fields and and make sense of certain criteria of at least necessary steps with many, many caveats to discuss as well, of course. Um, here I plot two new areas into this diagram. The red area highlights where flares and coronal mass ejections could dissociate the ozone in a planetary atmosphere. As ozone is the primary, primary absorbent for harmful radiation, the next stellar outbursts uh, can then penetrate through and sterilize all surface biology. So that's why we call it the ozone sterilization zone here. And we know this red area thanks to atmospheric models and computer simulations. Uh, such as those by the, the Segura group here, or Tilly 2019. And in particular, um, a lot of caveats to discuss in this regime about what assumptions for atmospheres we need to make. Um, also, like whether we have to go from like 1D atmospheric chemistry to 3D atmospheric chemistry, because there's tidal locking and things at play. So there's a lot to be refined, uh, of course. But I think it's a really nice first step to put these two fields together. The green area, on the other hand, uh, it's again a new field. It's uh, one that highlights that life needs an energy source to originate. So while this could be lightning strikes or hydrothermal events, and I know many people here in the EII community are working on these type of things, um, other fields uh, or other scientists uh, are looking at how it could come from stellar UV light. And as I said earlier, uh, red dwarfs alone, they have too little UV light to actually trigger this but their stellar flares are the perfect delivery mechanism for UV light and UV chemistry. So this green area here is drawn from actual laboratory prebiotic chemistry studies that were driven by Paul Rimmer's group in Cambridge uh, in Rimmer 2018 here. And uh, just to highlight, yeah, I really love this figure because it unites all these multidisciplinary aspects that go into our very young and, and very fastly developing astrobiology field that we're all working on. And speaking of a young field, <laughs> as an unintended segue, but let me speak a bit about the early years, uh, about age. Um, and I hinted at this a little bit before, um, what we can learn about the times where like life was actually meant to be or assumed to be like developing, so millions and millions of years ago in the early stages uh, of, of a planetary formation process. 
we can also study the stars at this time. Uh, we might not have that many young planets that we can probe, but if we can get a consistent relationship over age between how stars develop, uh, how fast do they spin, how um, active are they, and especially how intense is their flaring, how much UV light do they put out at certain stages, then we can compare these uh, aspects and a, a very first step approximation here again, or first step estimate is to compare young associations versus field stars, um, where we know the median ages of the young association stars, we know there may be like around 100 million years uh, young in these cases that I show here, um, or the field stars that mm, might be, you know, the age of our sun. And there's some interesting things that we're still trying to decipher. For example, if we look at the fraction of targets with observed flares on the y-axis versus the effective temperature, we can see the same trend as before. Um, FGK type stars don't seem to flare all that much, but suddenly we ramp up for the M-type stars. But we ramp up much faster for the field-type stars than we do for the young association stars, which is interesting. So in if we pick out an, an M0 star here, um, or a star around 3,500 Kelvin here, then we see about 15% of the old stars of this type are flaring in our data set, or I should clarify, are observed to be flaring, taking care of all the observational biases. Um, but at this effective temperature of 3,500 Kelvin, only about 2% of all the young stars are found to be flaring. So it's a very interesting point. So again, this is something where we have to be very careful in interpreting this and in cleaning this of any biases that might be in there. But uh, it's still a very intriguing finding. Why does it seem that uh, the young stars at the same effective temperature flare less than their older companions? Now, while looking into these kind of questions, um, we actually, a couple of years ago, found a couple of very interesting young M dwarfs that are very active and strange. Um, but normal M dwarfs are actually quite boring. You know, If we see this one here, TJ1243, a spotted star with differential rotation, rotates faster than the day, you would think there's a lot happening. But if we look at it in a uh, Lomskagel SNR diagram, uh, so a periodogram or frequency diagram, we see there's actually just two peaks uh, so one or two signals that show the differential rotation of the star. And it's basically a very simple harmonic, you know, sinusoidal uh, modulation that we see in this light curve here. But by looking for flares on certain types and by looking for extremely young and extremely active stars, we did find this new class of complex rotators. Um, and we were not the first ones to find them. They were found in Kepler by the Stauffer team uh, just a few years before us. Um, and in, in Sun and Gunter uh, 2019, we then uh, made the same discovery um, in test data. And this is one of these examples here, the light curve that we show here. You can see a lot of zigzag patterns. And zigzag in a periodogram, in a Lomskagel SNR uh, frequency diagram, always shows up as many, many, many harmonics. So we have dozens of signals here. And that's actually the, the fast fire way of finding these type of really strange young complex rotators in our data sets by looking at these harmonics. But the question then arose, like, why are they there? <laughs> why are they so active? And because many of them flare uh, a lot as well. And what could this imply for the formation and evolution of small planetary systems around them? Well, what hypothesis could we come up with? Um, one hypothesis that was offered by the by Stauffer team and Andrew Cor uh, Collier Cameron's team was that maybe we actually have just a rotating star here and depending on how we look at it, we might have uh, some clouds of material uh, orbiting around it. And it's a patchy torus of clouds that is confined within the stellar magnetic field uh, happening to coincide with the co-rotation radius. So these clouds rotate at the same period, are trapped in the magnetic field and that's why they're stable there. And they either absorb light or maybe they actually might be reflecting some light just before they get occulted by the star. Um, so it's still a bit open what, what exactly the details of this hypothesis could be. And uh, another hypothesis that came up was, uh, what if we actually like take into account that much of this is driven by spots and we have a misaligned disk and the spot gets hidden underneath the disk once in a while. So we have a negative transit. We gain some light when the spot gets hidden uh, because the spot usually causes these uh, dimming events. 
And again, we have a viewing angle dependency. So um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with active, active galactic nuclei, uh, but back in my days, uh, <laughs> I, did, I did a little bit of research uh, as, a, as a bachelor student on this topic. And there was a very similar unifying hypothesis um, that it's all down to the viewing angle dependency. So in probing these two hypotheses and actually a whole slew of, of more hypotheses, uh, we tried to find out what we can rule out, um, what could be the actual reason. And in the end, you know, depending on what it is, if there's really evidence that all of these young M dwarfs uh, have clouds of material or have some kind of uh, dust disk very close in to their host star, then one might open the questions about how this can influence the formation of uh, exoplanetary atmospheres or of rocky bodies around them. And maybe that's something correlated with the whole uh, findings that we have of these sub-Neptunes and super-Earths being so frequent around young M dwarfs. Now, the first test that we did here, and I'm going to wrap up in like about five minutes, uh, so we have a bit of uh, time for questions as well, is uh, do the occurrence rates make sense? Um, so in this diagram here, I show the effective temperature in Kelvin on the y-axis, the rotation period on the x-axis in days, and all the blue points were all the test targets that we had in our sample here. And that blue square is basically where we marked, okay, um, this is about the regime where we find these complex rotators in rotation periods from 0.1 to 2 days and around temperatures from 2,700 to 3,600 Kelvin. And the red dots that you see here are actually these 10 targets that we found in the first two months of data uh, from tests. And all the blue points are other fast rotating M dwarfs, but they don't show these uh, strange modulations. So if it's actually just due to a viewing angle dependency, do the occurrence rates make sense? And the answer is yes, for these two hypotheses. Um, don't worry about this like uh, simple equations down here. I can just tell you um, both the hypotheses make sense. There are enough M dwarfs out there. Um, it probably requires that maybe uh, that at least the majority or maybe all of our fast rotating young M dwarfs have some type of dust disk or co-orbital clouds trapped very close to them, which again might have implications for exoplanet formation in the end. Um, but the numbers definitely uh, play out. The second test that we ran was, uh, do we see color dependencies? And for this, we used again, the ground-based speculus survey and uh, took multicolor observations um, to compare them with the test data. Um, so we can see here uh, the test data in gray, uh, all the light curves, um, and on the bottom, the color coding, as well as the green, uh, orange, blue, and dark red, uh, sorry, or, or orange, red, and dark red uh, filters for the GRIZ filters. And we can see that the bluer we go, the more detail we can see, the more contrast we can see, because, um, well, the spot contrast on the surface is very dependent on that. Flares, as, set, uh, as you can see in the very rightmost panel here, uh, we can't even see this flare in the infrared set filter, but we can very clearly see a bunch of flares actually, actually kicking off in uh, the G filter, in the much bluer filter, um, because of the bias, uh, observational bias, that a flare is very hot and the star is actually very cold. Um, but again, uh, we can say, yes, we see the color dependencies. Um, and the prominence is these like little dips and zigzag patterns that we can see get much stronger when we go to the bluer uh, wavelength spectrum in our filters. And again, that can mean um, that both hypotheses could work um, because both dust and um, any type of molecular mixture in these clouds um, could account for that. So we definitely are on the right, on the right path here. Uh, we can see the expected features, but we still can't decipher which of these hypotheses is, is the correct one. Um, the third test that we did here is are these modulations stable and long-lived? And we found out, yes, um, at least over one year, some of them even now after three years uh, or even five years of observations uh, still hold uh, and are still very stable. Others have started to change. And the interesting aspect is as well, um, you can see some changes here marked in this little um, dashed box here between different weeks and, and months of observations. And then they came back to a normal uh, state. Uh, sometimes we can see big flares kicking in and suddenly the profile changes completely as if material is ejected by this flare and the coronal mass ejection that might have come with it. 
So again, um, that might actually be a really nice uh, tracer for what young exoplanets forming in this vicinity might experience at the same time. If a big flare kicks in and ejects tons of material that's orbiting close to the star, then it will probably also have detrimental effects on the exoplanetary atmosphere. So in the end, I just want to summarize with this big table. I don't uh, want you to read it. I just want to show that we went through a ton of different hypotheses here, um, looked at them, try to rule out what we could rule out, um, try to decipher what might still be possible, what uh, might be less likely. And we still don't have uh, a proper answer. My best guess is it's probably a mix of everything, as always. Uh, I don't think there's a it's this hypothesis or that hypothesis answer here. I think there are spots involved. I think there is some form of material involved, uh, involved either as a patchy torus or as a, as a disk. Um, and it will be an interplay of, of many, many things. But if we understand these better, as I said, then we have a much better tracer for the uh, evolution of stars and planetary systems over time. And with this, I want to uh, pop open my summary slide. And very quickly before I, before I go to that, uh, just another brief reminder, save the date. Um, there's a fourth call for announcements of opportunity coming. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. Otherwise, keep the dates in mind, uh, prepare your proposals, and I'll leave open my summary slides. Thank you very much for your attention. Nono Santos, please ask a question, please. Yes, um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. I have I have a question. I have two questions actually. The first is about TOI 270. You showed the oxygen uh, signature uh, yeah, or the yeah. potential oxygen signature. Uh, are you sure? I, I mean, uh, could it be that this is caused by stellar activity as well? Because there are different papers suggesting that there's an ambiguity in this. Uh, kind of detections. Yeah, thanks for the question, Nuno. So that, uh, just to clarify, so this goes back to, to this plot about TI 270 and uh, the recent study that uh, was led by Tom Mikkel Evans and, and uh, our team on this topic where we say we found evidence for water uh, feature that you can see here in a hydrogen rich atmosphere. And yeah, absolutely. Um, there's always the danger with these spectra um, that there is a pollution uh, by stellar heterogeneity. Um, we did our best here that we can. So we monitored the star photometrically um, for activity indicators like lemon alpha lines, et cetera, uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, we have a very high resolution spectra uh, with Harps and Espresso um, on this as well. And we don't see any indication for, for any stellar activity in, in all of these. Um, so it's a completely flat light curve. Um, it has, I think it was... Lyman, uh, was it H alpha in, I, I have to look up the details again, H alpha in, in absorption, which is an indication. Uh, I have to look that one up again, but it was an indication for um, for basically the star being being very quiet. But that doesn't, doesn't rule out that there might be something that we can't catch with these existing instruments. Um, so the only, the only way forward will be to gather more data. I said, this one is based um, on one observation with HST. We have two more observations, um, but there were some issues with the with the scheduling of these um, that made it hard to to really squeeze something out of the data. So far, we're looking into getting the most out of this data for a follow up paper, and the way forward would really be look at it again with HST, look at it with JWST, and make really sure that this builds up. Okay, thank you. Uh, indeed, the second transit would be nice to have. Yeah. So my, my my second question is about your before last slide. Um, actually, where you have this table with the overview of the different possibilities to explain these strange uh, variabilities. Uh, I, I am not sure if I understood why spots only, or let's say spots plus facular or plagues, mm -hmm. whatever, cannot explain this modulation. Can you clarify? Yeah. yeah. So I'll go back to this plot. I don't have the plot on like the spot models. Basically, we and, and many other groups um, tried very hard <laughs> to fit uh, anything crazy up to like 20 small spots in, in strange uh, configurations, spots in, in facular and or hot spots 
uh, as well as very dark spots in uh, any type of geometric pattern. And the thing is always the same. Um, every combination of spots you put on there is going to lead to something like this in the Lomskagel paradigm. It's always sinusoidal because you basically add up a lot of sinusoids. Even if you shift some of the sinusoids in phase, you change the amplitude, you're going to have a, a very simple structure built out of eight sinusoids, which in the end gives you one peak, uh, which is the rotation period. You can introduce differential rotation on different layers, different latitudes. Um, then you might, like here, have a second peak or maybe a third peak, but you never end up uh, constructing something zigzag out of overlapping a lot of sinusoids. Um, there are some papers by uh, by some groups that say if you if you have a zebra striped uh, um, spot uh, pattern, so basically the whole star has zebra stripes, um, then you could build up something more complex looking like this. Uh, and I don't disagree with that. Um, but the question is, I think like right now still very open. Uh, do we more believe in some like form of material around the star or do we more believe in zebra striped stars? Um, I think right now we're trying to get all the observational evidence either way and see what happens. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that, that is a question by Andreas Birrenbach over the chat. How strong is the evidence that big flares are always or usually or sometimes accompanied by coronal mass ejections? Can you prove it in individual cases? Yeah, that, that is a very good question. One I, I haven't, uh, I think, stated clearly enough. The only evidence we have right now that big flares come accompanied with coronal mass ejections comes from the sun. Uh, so that's the only star where we really unambiguously can observe coronal mass ejections uh, because we're sitting very close and we have the appropriate uh, measurement techniques for it. For any type of exoplanet host star or, or star other than our sun, there have been less than a handful of papers, I would say, um, that have claimed detection of CMEs. Um, depending on who you ask in the community, people are, um, you know, have different opinions on that or are skeptical. Um, some people, some people trust the results, but I think we're just really entering this era where we find CMEs on our stars. And something that people are doing, for example, is look at the star planet interactions and uh, look in the radio, for example, whether they can see any type of aurora caused on, uh, on the exoplanets. And uh, that could be a sign of the CME hitting the exoplanet. So there's a lot of uh, very creative ways to look into that. Um, but yeah, basically to answer your question again is uh, the only evidence we have is from the sun. So whether this holds true in an M dwarf star, we have no idea. Um, it could be that all these flares that I showed you on M dwarf stars actually don't come with coronal mass ejections because for some reason the physics there works different. Um, but if we say the same physics apply as like in the stellar, uh, atmosphere of our sun um, to the stellar atmosphere of M dwarfs, we would assume that flares uh, that have energies of beyond like 10 to the 30 ERG uh, would usually come accompanied with coronal mass ejections. Um, again, though, the, with the caveat that the scaling laws, if we look at the sun, and there's actually quite clear scaling, uh, scaling relationship of how many kilograms or tons of uh, CME material of plasma gets ejected with a, a flare of a given energy. Uh, so one can derive very clean empirical laws. If we apply the same empirical laws and extrapolate into the regime of these super flares, and again, I can show this flare frequency uh, diagram um, compared with the sun, this one here. If we extrapolate this, then <laughs> the, the kilograms uh, ejected by uh, M dwarf flares uh, would actually blow away like a tenth of the star because they are so energetic. So at some point, the scaling law that we have for our our sun breaks and, and doesn't hold true anymore for M dwarfs. But uh, yeah, so far we don't know. Yeah. Are there any more questions? I don't really see any hand raised. I, I, think this, really I see a question from Marcus in the chat. Oh, uh, yes. I'm sorry about that. Yes, I did not scroll down. Uh, did I see one? I did not. Let me just open the chat again. Uh, Yeah, I'm afraid I don't really see the question of Marcus. Probably was only 
uh, sent to you. So let me I, can, yeah, yes. I can read it out. Actually, quickly. yeah, Markus Janssen. So, okay, perhaps you mentioned it, but can you elaborate on the ages of the young associations included when comparing flaring with the field star population? Yeah, so these ones here are all drawn from Banyan Sigma, and the ones we had here usually range between 50 to 150 mega years. 